John's first letter, chapter 3, the first three verses, follow along with me, where John writes as follows. 
How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are, exclamation point. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Now in just a moment, John's going to give us some great encouragement from these verses, but before we do that, there's one sore thumb that sticks out of the text that I want to cover on the front end. So with thumb number one and only this morning, I want you to please note John's implication that we as believers have a lack of knowledge when it comes to the subject of God. Look at verse 2b. But we know that when He, meaning God in, in Jesus Christ, when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And the clear implication here is that right now, we do not see Him as He is. Now the question that immediately comes to mind is, how did John know that there was a whole lot more to Jesus than we see and understand now? Well, you need to remember that John was a part of that inner circle of Jesus. That inner circle was comprised of three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And the inner circle of Jesus got to go special places with them. Places where none of the other disciples got to go. They got to go to pray with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night of His arrest. They went behind closed doors with Jesus to watch Him heal Jairus' daughter, the ruler of the synagogue there in Capernaum. And in Matthew 17, they go up on the mountain of transfiguration. Just the three of them with Jesus. And let me read to you what happened up there. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Listen to this story. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. Some of the gospel writers say lightning. And his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. When Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And so what's John doing here in our text for this morning? Now that Jesus is raised from the dead, he's letting the cat out of the bag is what that happened up there on that mountain of transfiguration. He's talking about the true glory of God that he saw on that mountain in Jesus. John's saying, you think you know Jesus? You don't know Jesus. You think you have an understanding of God? You don't have an understanding of God. You think you've read the Gospels and you have all the attributes and the characteristics of Jesus all tied up in nice, neat little wrapping? You've read the Bible and you have a scriptural understanding of the God of the universe and He fits nicely into your nice little God box? John's saying, let me tell you something. The God of the universe doesn't fit into anybody's box. And you don't understand the first thing about Him. Whatever you think God is doing in your life right now, He probably isn't. Let me say it again. Whatever you think God is doing in your life right now, He probably isn't. Because He wants to bring you to the point where what He does is not important. But that you're with Him is everything. You see, God is bigger than your box. God is bigger than your understanding. He's bigger than Scripture, bigger than a theology book, bigger than doctrine, bigger than the universe. Thinking that we understand God after the minute exposure our lives have had to Him? It's like a tadpole trying to understand all of the vast oceans of our planet at one time. It's just not going to happen in this lifetime. 
You see, John had caught a glimpse of Jesus' real glory. And so he wants his readers to know that there's a lot more glory to come. I love John 17. We spent two months on it when we studied the Gospel of John. It's the high and holy priestly prayer. When Jesus prays to His Father right before His arrest in the garden. And there's some wonderful things in there. I want to share two verses with you from John 17. And about the glory of God. Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in Your presence with the glory I had with You before the world began. Verse 24. Father, I want those You have given me. He's talking about the believers. He's talking about you and I. Father, I want those You have given me, the believers, to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory You have given me because You loved me before the creation of the world. Did you get that? Jesus wants you and I to behold His true glory with Him and with His Father in heaven. Whew. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the light show. We're going to sit around the throne with Jesus and I'm going to elbow you and say, didn't I tell you? Man, isn't He wonderful? Isn't He marvelous? Isn't He something else? Man, look at Him shine. I love Isaiah 6. When Isaiah meets the real God for the very first time. Isaiah is proud to be a Jew. He knows his Torah. He's decked out in the orthodox clothing and the vestments of the day. He's in the temple humming an old Jewish hymn tune and polishing the golden candlesticks when the God of the universe really comes to him. Let me read it to you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It wasn't what Isaiah expected, was it? The God he expected wasn't the God who showed up. And you'll find exactly the same thing if you're a believer. God is bigger than your understanding of Him. And you know what? That makes Him bigger than your problems. God is bigger than your cancer. He's bigger than your finances. He's bigger than your loneliness. He's bigger than your family problems or your marriage problems, your medical problems. He's bigger than your fear or your worry. You may have heard me say, if you've never stood before God and been afraid, you've never stood before God. That's true. But let me add one other thing to that. If you've never stood before God and been confused, you've never stood before God. You know, the older I get, the less sure I become about a lot of things I thought I understood about this world. And often lately, that transcends right into my understanding of God. The paradox is, the less I find out that I know about the God of the universe, the more sure I am of Him. Father, I don't understand You, but I trust You. All right, with that appetizer out of the way, I'm on the main course for this morning, encouraging the family. Can we talk? Be honest with me. Have you... Have you ever just wanted to give this thing up? To check it all and simply walk away? Have you ever just got tired and said, I just don't want to do this anymore? Do you ever look at your besetting sin, that, that cherished sin, the one you go back to God with time after time after time, day after day after day, and think, I can't go back another time with this? I mean, God's got to be embarrassed when He sees me coming. I know I'm embarrassed to go before Him again. And do you ever think, I just, I just can't do this any longer? Well, when that happens, realize where your nose ought to be. It ought to be in the pages of God's Word. Because there's real help here. There's answers to your questions and answers to your problem. All right here. Ted Williams, the great baseball player, said this. 
Every baseball team could use a man who plays every position perfectly, who never strikes out, and never makes an error. The trouble is, there's no way to make him lay his hot dog down and come down out of the stands and play. You know, I found that most Christians who have it easy are not trying very hard to be Christians. They're still sitting in the stands shouting, Praise the Lord, isn't Jesus wonderful? But they're afraid to get out on the battlefield and fight for fear that it might cost them something. Their faith is one of words and not deeds. But on the other hand, those who are down in the trenches fighting the battle every day, not talking, fighting, those trying to keep their head above water, hanging on to the fingernails, trying to make a difference in this world, those are the ones getting worn out and they need encouragement. And that's what this text has to offer. John understood the supernatural battle because he had his own problems. And he wanted to encourage us here. And he does. And so the subject before the house this morning, encouragement for a tired family. And I believe it came from the throne. For those keeping score, I've got five points. Let's take a look at them. First of all, I want you to note a curious love. Verses 1a and b. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Verse 2a. Dear friends, now we are the children of God. Earlier, I added two. If you've never stood before God and been afraid. If you've never stood before God and been confused. Let me add one more thing. If you've never stood before God and been absolutely blown away, amazed, and astonished, then you have never stood before God. Do you understand that the God of the universe loves you? And it's not the kind of love that says if you're good, then I'll love you. It's unconditional love that loves you no matter what. In fact, the worse you are, the more He has to love you. That's why we're given the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. When the bad son came home after squandering away his inheritance, he got treated like a king. And the good son got ticked off. But the bad son needed more love at that particular time because his actions were unlovable. And God does exactly the same thing with you and I. Let me tell you something. When the chips are down and you're down, we have a God that doesn't back off. He rolls up his sleeves and he gets involved and he loves you more. And when I see that kind of love, it amazes me. And I want to sing with Beth Shea, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all that God loves me. <laughs> the love of God. Nobody's understood it yet. And I don't understand it either. How God could love somebody like me blows me away. And verse 1 goes on to say that that love makes me a child of God. And don't ever forget when you're a child of God who your father is and who your older brother is. I have a friend down in Florida whose husband left her and then divorced her few years back. And she's a beautiful lady, inside and out. And you know what she said to Love and I? She said, if I ever get married again, I'm going to marry the ugliest, fattest man I can find. So he won't leave me. And beloved, I want you to know, she did. I'm sorry, but we're talking ugly and fat. I mean, he's four times her size. And when they walk down the sidewalk holding hands, it looks like a dad with his little girl. But let me tell you something else about him. He sits around and he grins all the time. And you know why? Because he just can't believe that she married him. And he is so pleased and so happy about having her that it blows him away. And folks, that's the way we ought to feel when we realize the reality of John 15, 16, where Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And when we understand not only His choosing us, but calling us to Himself, making us His children, we ought to be grinning too. You know, I don't have any trouble with God existing. I mean, this thing didn't just happen. You've got to be moron to think He doesn't exist. I don't have any trouble with God existing. I don't have any trouble with God being sovereign. I don't have any trouble with God being creator and sustainer of all that there is. But to see Him as my Father, man, that humbles me. 
for him to want me to be so close to him in our relationship, he requests me to call him daddy. That leaves me amazed. And when I'm down and depressed and I want to give up, I remember that. And I feel a whole lot better. Secondly, I want you to know, not only a curious love, I want you to know the colossal mistake, verse 1c. The world does not know us. Talking about believers, the family of God. The world doesn't know us. One time Ann Landers was at an embassy function, a cocktail party. And a very pompous, loudmouth politician came up to her and said, Well, so, you're Ann Landers. Say something funny. And without blinking an eye, she said, So, you're a politician. Lie to me. Well, politicians do lie. And we believe them because we're a naive, gullible bunch. But let me tell you the biggest lie anybody ever believed. And that is that Christians, the children of God, are of no account. I get so tired of the way the media portrays and reports religion in the church. I mean, every time the religion makes the 5 o'clock or the 11 o'clock news, it's some wacko weirdo that the world can make fun of. The last story I saw on TV about the church was on snake handling churches in the mountains of Tennessee. Someone else who saw it too said to me, you pastored a church in the mountains of Tennessee. Did you have any of that snake handling going on? I said, well, we had some real snakes in our congregation. I just didn't have them. <laughs> what about a radio talk show? When they have a good conversation on controversial topic and Christians have good biblical views on and they screen out every Christian with a brain and they put the morons on You're on the air. Yeah, well, I, I think the only answer is to bomb all the abortion clinics in the world. Or our topic for today, fur coats and the killing of animals to make them. Go ahead, you're on the air. Well, you know, how Jesus said in a sermon on the mount, that the minks will inherit the earth if we're not careful. So that's why I kill them and make coats out of them. Meek, not me, you idiot. The meek will inherit the earth. That's the kind of press we Christians get. The world makes fun of Christians. They make fun of honesty. They make fun of virginity. They make fun of moral values. But you see, it's because they don't know us. They don't understand who we are. They think we're on the outside, but really we're on the inside. We have life-saving news that they don't have. <clears throat> we're a part of the world of the living, and they're a part of the world of the dying. And we got to remember, they're our business. We're here for them. So remember who you are. You're a child of the King. And someday they're going to know it too. But it's going to be too late. And sometimes when I'm tired and I want to give up and walk away, I remember who I am. I'm a child of the Most High God. And I feel whole lot better. Thirdly, I want you to see not only a curious love and a colossal mistake, I want you to know the comforting fact. Look at verse 1c. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. A comforting verse. You heard of comfort food? This is a comfort verse. 1 Corinthians 10.13 God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Let me stop there and say this verse is very much misquoted. It says you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. I hear people say God will not give you anything you can't handle. Oh my goodness. He'll give you so much that you can't handle that you have to come to Him so that He can help you handle it. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. Now that's comforting to know when you're being tempted, right? Let me give you another comfort verse. 2 Corinthians 1.4 The God of all comfort comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. In other words, we're comforted in all our troubles so that we in turn can comfort others. And that brings me to a principle, and it's this. A burden is significantly lighter 
if you know someone else has shouldered it before you. Let me say it again. A burden is significantly lighter if you know someone else has shouldered it before you. You know one of the things I love about being a pastor? It's after 26 years of listening to people's problems and confessions and heartaches, there is no weird thought that I've had that's so weird, no sin so bad, no doubt so deep, that I haven't discovered it in you too. And that's comforting. As I've listened to you talk, I've said, man, they are a lot like me, and I am a lot like them, and we are a lot like each other. That's the principle. A burden is significantly lighter if you know someone else has shouldered it before you. God used Steve Brown and his teaching to bring me into the kingdom. And it seemed at the time that every word from every sermon was written especially for me. And then when we finally met in Indianapolis, he comforted my wounds in person over my father's death. And I found out that every word was for me. You see, Steve had just lost his younger brother the same month I lost my dad. His brother was 35 years old. He was running for the governorship of North Carolina, and he was going to win. And then he died of a massive heart attack, and Steve's heart was broken too. And every word he wrote, every word he preached, every word he spoke to me personally empathized with my situation because Steve was there too. And it felt a lot better knowing that my friend was shouldering the same burden I was, that I wasn't alone. And again, the principle, a burden is significantly lighter if you know someone else has shouldered it before you. Let me tell you something that helps even more. To know that God has shouldered it before you also. At the right time, 2,000 years ago, he entered time and space in a stable in Bethlehem. And then he grew up. And he experienced everything that you will ever experience, even death. He was different. He was spurned. He was turned away. He was an outsider. You see, God's been on the outside too. He was only 15 years old when he came into my study down in Tennessee. He was a problem child. He dabbled in the occult. He was a steady drug user. And his mother had forced him to come. He sat in my study, sullen, withdrawn, and angry. I watched him sit there and squirm for a while. And I said, son, you don't want to be here. Your mother made you come, didn't she? Not a word. And so finally I said, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't want to be here either. Your mother made me come too. And then the Holy Spirit lanced the oil. And He began to pour out everything that was on the inside. And He said, I'm an outsider. I've always been an outsider. I don't fit in. I'm different than everybody else. And he went on for about a half an hour. His dad was a farmer and they had a lot of land that was wooded and mountainous. And so I asked him, I said, would it be okay if I brought my dirt bike up and go riding with you? He said, sure. He's faced it up. And we became motorcycle buddies. We did a lot of trail riding together. And then one day when we were up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere, I told him about Jesus. I told him Jesus was an outsider too. And how he was different than everybody else. And how Jesus didn't fit in either. And a couple of months later, he accepted Christ and I baptized him there at the church. Less than a year later, he was on his way home from a date, fell asleep, and his pickup hit a gravel truck head on and killed him instantly. And I had his funeral. That was a bunch of years ago. And that was difficult for me to go through with his family. But I felt a whole lot better knowing that he left this world belonging to Jesus. Someone who was an outsider just like he was. You see, a burden is significantly lighter 
if you know someone else's shoulder up before you. Jesus said they persecuted me. They're going to do the same thing with you. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to hate you too. Jesus said they made some mistakes about me. They thought I was just a carpenter's son and they'll make mistakes about you. They won't understand. So you come on over here and you stand with me. Stand with me on the outside. And pretty soon, when enough people join us, we won't be outsiders anymore. They will. And sometimes when I'm really down and I just want to walk away, I remember that being an outsider with Jesus is a pretty great place to be. Fourthly, I want you to see not only a curious love, a colossal mistake, and a comforting fact, but I want you to know a certain hope. And I love this passage. I love this verse, and this is my favorite part. Verse 2, dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. How about that? If you belong to Jesus, you're going to be just like Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, you're going to be just like Jesus. When I coached Little League, at the end of every game, I would award the game ball to the player who deserved it. The one who stood out, who played the hardest and the best in that game, gave it all they had. Well, guess what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, everybody gets a game ball. If you're on my team, you're going to get a game ball. And you're going to play as good as me. You're going to play as good as the coach. Let me give you a principle. If you know the result of the process, then the process is bearable. Let me say it again. If you know the end of the process, then the process is bearable. Gary Morning is a, a dear friend of mine. And he was a pastor down at Brownstown Christian Church for 22 years. That was the church I grew up in. The church my mom and sisters attended until I moved back to Seymour and then they started attending here. But Gary has always been so good to me. In fact, until Gary retired, he would ask me every year to preach the services at Brownstown Christian when I came home on summer vacation to visit my mom and family. <laughs> Now, to be very honest and humble, when I'd come back that one Sunday in the summer each year, the church would fill up. And it didn't have anything to do with great preaching. It was simply the curious who couldn't believe it. It was folks who had watched me grow up in that town. And they would come to church and they would sit there and I could see them just shaking their heads. And they'd say, I can't believe it. It really can't be him. Bill Lockman, a preacher? Who would have thought? Well, anyway, there was this man in the church that I had plenty of differences with while I was growing up in that town. He had never liked me at all, and I didn't care much for him. They made him into an elder in that church. And he was there that first summer when I went back to preach. And after the service was over, he came up to me in front of everybody. And he put his arm around me. And he said, Bill, that was awesome. I always knew you'd make something great of yourself. And I wanted to throw up and say, you're lying through your teeth. Yeah. You thought I'd turn out to be a horse thief or a serial killer. Be honest. Watch out, you don't break your leg jumping on a bandwagon. Listen, if I was choosing a pastor, I wouldn't have chosen me. I have too much trouble with this stuff. I try so hard to be obedient, and I just can't pull it off. I want you to know if I was choosing a pastor, I certainly wouldn't have chosen somebody like me. I would have chosen somebody a lot more spiritual than me. But let me tell you something. You've never seen a man who wants to please God more than I do. You've never seen a man who wants to be more like Jesus than I do. And that's why I love this verse. Because he promises me here that I am going to be like him. I'm going to be just like him. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And he 
never lies. And then fifthly and finally, very quickly, I want you to see not only a curious love, a colossal mistake, a comforting fact, and a certain hope, I want you to note a careful process. Verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, God, is pure. The Greek word for purify here means the constant, never-ending cleansing process for purification that makes something cleaner and purer as time passes. Kind of like the refiner's fire. One more Bruiser story and we're through. Let me finish with this. Bruiser the Wonder Dog was a beautiful German Shepherd. When we brought him home at eight weeks old, he was an 11 pound little ball of black fur. When he was full grown, he was huge at 126 pounds. Now understand the normal weight range for an adult German Shepherd is 65 to 85 pounds. When Bruiser was six months old, he already weighed more than 80 pounds. When he was a pup, he chewed everything. He chewed us out of house and home. Everything inside. And so I built a nice kennel out back under the shade tree with a concrete floor and a roof on it, a dog house in it. We always had had a dog in the house. and I couldn't wait until we could trust Bruiser. We could bring him in the house for good. I trained him every day, put him back into the kennel. But when he was six months old, love flew out to speak at a weekend retreat. And so Stevie and I came up with a great idea. We decided it would be a good time to get Bruiser a bath and get him all cleaned up and bring him into the house with Mom gone. I told Stevie that Bruiser was probably old enough that he wouldn't chew things anymore, hopefully. And we could leave him inside. And so we cleaned him up and we brought him in. My office was in our home down in Florida. And so I went out into the office to work for a while. I let Bruiser run free in the house. About an hour later, I, I went to check on him and I couldn't find him. And when I finally found him, he was in our bedroom, laying between the bed and the wall. And he had eaten a pair of love's favorite shoes. Now, I don't hit my dogs. But I yelled at him and I said, bad dog, bad dog. I called him everything I could think of in that bad dog tone. And I put him back in the kennel. About an hour later, I was looking out the back window. He was there in the kennel and he just looked pitiful. He had his head down between his front paws and those two big old ears looked like two sails on top of his head. So I, I went out to check on him. I could tell from the moment I got there, he was repentant. He immediately started begging to go back into the house. He said, Master, that's what he called me. Master, could I please, please, please go back into the house? It's hot out here. You know we live in the state of Florida. I love being in the house. I love the littlest boy. He loves me. He plays with me all the time. And it's so much fun. I'm so bored out here. Could I please go back into the house? I said, Bruiser, have you learned your lesson? He said, yes. I said, no more chewing? He said, no more chewing, I promise. I warned him that mom was going to be mad about the shoes when she got home. So I brought him back in that night. And we were watching TV. We were in the bedroom. I was laying on the bed and Bruiser was on the floor. And it was awfully quiet for a long, long time. And so I looked over the bed down on the floor he had had another pair of mom's good shoes chewing on them. And so I jumped up and I scolded him again, bad dog. And I took him back out to the kennel. I mean, I trusted the dumb dog for a second time. And a second time he let me down and chewed the second pair of shoes. And I went back out to the kennel and I yelled at him some more and I said, mom's coming home tomorrow. And she's going to be ticked. But she won't stay mad at you for very long. Because she just doesn't. She'll scratch you behind the ears and you'll make that stupid little grin and she'll love you anyway. When I came back into the house, I was out in my office talking to myself, saying, I can't believe that dumb dog. 
I cleaned him up. I brought him into my house. I loved him. I gave him the rules. And he breaks the rules and he eats a pair of shoes. And then, then, as if that's not enough, I trust him again. I bring him in again. And he does it a second time. And he eats another pair of shoes. And at that moment, God said to me, Bill, you're like that too. I cleaned you up on the cross. I brought you into my house. I gave you the rules and you've been breaking them ever since. And then I trust you again and you disappoint me again. I said, Father, you're right. So I walked back out to the kennel. And I said, Bruiser, someday you're going to be a better dog. And God said to me, Bill, someday you're going to be a better child. Sometimes I'll chasten you the way you chase them, Bruiser. And sometimes I'll simply love you the way love is going to love Bruiser when she gets home. But I will never give up on you. And here's my promise. Someday, someday, you're going to be just like Jesus. So I said to Bruiser, Bruiser, did you know that someday I'm going to be like Jesus? And he said, is Jesus as good as Mama? And I said, Jesus is the one who made Mama good. And Bruiser said, then I'm going to be like Jesus too. Smart dog. Remember, the process is bearable if you know the end. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for second and third and fourth and fifth and a hundredth and a thousandth and a million chances. We thank you that no matter what we do, you'll never have to turn your back on us. Nothing we could do would make you turn and walk away. We really don't get that. We don't have that kind of unconditional love to draw upon. We know it's true. We've just never seen it or experienced it other than from you. And so we thank you. We thank you for that. We thank you that we have a small, minute understanding of you like the tadpole in the ocean. We want to know more about you, but it's, it's not a requirement. You have a plan that included us from day one, and, and that's okay if we don't ever know anything more about you. Other than what we already know, that you died on the cross in our place, you loved us that much, you'll never stop loving us. And your grace flows into our lives every day. And so we come just to say, hey, thanks for giving it to us. Thanks for encouraging us when we're down. Thanks for truly letting us know that we belong to you and someday we're going to be like your only son. I thank you for that verse. It means a lot. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like. And it's in his name.